Hey everyone, how you going? Let's check this one out. Ian Fleming, Alistair Crowley and how the occultists... The war in the West was won, Adolf Hitler proclaimed shortly after the Nazis' victory in their campaign against the French in May 1940. By June 25, France had surrendered to the right, while Britain held steadfast in the refusal to seek peace agreements with Germany. Thus ended a series of early military operations of German allies against the German Reich that, until this time, had only been sparing significance. And this had prompted U.S. Senator William Braw that in late 1939 that there is something phony about this war. Now, there was no question regarding the authenticity of the conflict. Had it not been for the German strategic bombings of England and Northern Ireland that Germany launched beginning a few months after France's surrender, Hitler may have gone so far as to attempt a full-scale invasion in Britain. In fact, plans for what he had been called Operation Sea Line had been in order at one time and ultimately postponed for the target date of September 24, 1940. However, it was eventually withdrawn completely in favour of what became known as the Blitz, during which London would sustain heavy German bombing each night for nearly two months. History has shown the flawed approaches in Hitler's oversight of the war. Had he allowed his generals to manage the conflicts rather than trying to do so on his own, there remains the possibility that history could have followed a very different and unfortunate path. However, the flaws of the Fuhrer's governance have become apparent early on, even among certain groups within the Reich. Rudolf Hess, Hitler's deputy and third in command, was no exception among those who eventually began to find flaws in his leadership judgment. Famous for his surprise solo flight to Scotland in May 1941, Hess later admitted the trip had been conceived shortly after a conversation with the Fuhrer in June 1940. Just prior to Hitler's initial formulation of the Operation Sea Line, published exchange between Hess and Hitler would eventually illustrate that Hitler Hess had grave doubts about carrying on a war against the British, painting Russia as the greatest perceived threat to the Germany at the time. The opinion was no doubt formulated with good reasons. By the end of the war, Russia's presence in the conflicts would ultimately prove instrumental in Hitler's defeat and Germany eventual surrender. By April 1944, Soviet forces had swept into Berlin and the Reichstag had been secured and captured by the month's end. Lost in the aftermath of the war itself, as well as such pivotal historic events as the subsequent trial at Nuremberg, are the more enigmatic qualities that can be attributed to Rudolf Hess. Following his late night flight to Scotland in 1941, Hess was captured and terribly found to suffer from amnesia and psychosis regarding to prompting Winston Churchill to assess that Hess had been a medical and not a criminal case and should be so regarded. Thus, his sentencing at Nuremberg resulted in life imprisonment rather than death. Hess served a term of incarceration for the remainder of his life, dying in 1987 in a Spandu prison. And yet many questions remain about the Deputy Führer. Perhaps more importantly, senses may have led to this otherwise seemingly erratic decision to fly all, all alone to Scotland under the presumption that somehow might have ensured. Strangely, some sources may indicate that there is an occult connection underlying the whole entire operation, which may have supplied a subversive influence aiming at luring Hess into engaging at such odd behaviour. British author and researcher Eric Alec Howe, primarily known for his book on occultism, had actually served in Britain's psych political warfare executive during World War II, exploring the potential for such things as psychological warfare, forgery techniques and the general exploitation of the enemy's hidden idiosyncrasies. Through the use of information and propaganda, Howe was recruited by a British service, Secret Service and became involved in a number of operations regarding Nazi interests in the occult, which eventually formed the basis for a number of books which would he would author on the subject. According to Howe, in 1932, the Nazis founded an astrological study group called... Oh gosh, don't even ask me to pronounce that. Sorry. 
In keeping with such historic interest, Nazi Minister for Propaganda Joseph Goebbels would also go on to appoint a Department of Occultism formed around the moniker of the Metaphysiology and Occultism and referred to thusly as the AMO. Regarding Nazi cult interest among the all high-ranking Nazis, it might be a shown description of the first meeting with Hitler revealed how he felt his life was forever changed. Following their introduction in Beer Hall in Germany in 1920, Hess described or observed character charismatic offerings. By 1940, this vision that Hess had seemed beyond seemed to maintain into a sense that he was now destined to fulfil some great war on behalf of Germany. Whatever his full intentions may have been, or the mental state under it, Hess seemed poised for action. German General Karl Ernest Hoschwer, who had mentioned mentored Hess for several years earlier in the studies of politics, Stated in his own feelings about Hess's unusual state of mind around the time of the Debbie Furor's flight to Scotland, as recorded by Dr. Reiner Heidenbrandt, Herrscher, for, sorry for saying it wrong, later would indicated that Hitler's astrological aspects were unusually malphalic. Shortly before Hess flew to Scotland, Hess's interpretation these aspects to mean that he personally must take the dangers that threaten the Fuhrer upon his shoulders in order to save Hitler and restore peace to Germany. In, es in essence, Hess felt that all manner of servitude to his leader, a visionary who by grace he shared his dream with him, was justified. This form, what would nearly could be likened to the sorts of manifest psychological servitude between master and student circulating over the time throughout a variety of significant series of events. Hess had, in fact, literally worked as a descriptionist during Hitler's period of incarceration in 1924, followed the failed beer hoard approach through, though imprisoned, Hitler's stream of thoughts were dictated to Hess and were later formed the basis of the infamous treatise Mein Kampf. There was also the fact that, in a very real sense, Hess had feared the repercussions of ongoing conflicts. Of his specific motives for historic solo flight, Hess's wife and had quoted him saying the following. My coming to England is, as I realised, so unusual that nobody would easily stand it. I was confronted by a very hard decision. I do not think I would have arrived at my final choice unless I had continually kept before my eyes the vision of an endless line of children's coffins with the weeping mothers behind them, both English and German, and another line of coffins of mothers mourning children. In regards to what circumstances contributed to Hess's devotion to the idea of coming alone to England, his actions resulted in a failed attempt at contacting supposed Anglo-German Nazi sympathisers. After crash landing his plane in Scotland, he was captured later imprisoned. One half of the story, at least. The rest with an odd set of circumstances had been enacted by the British Royal Navy during the same period in which spies, secret agents and even some degree of sorcery had been attempted in all effort to secure victory against the Hitler and the Third Reich, the secret agent. Interestingly, interestingly that Hess had been would attempt this epic solo flight had, according to some sources, already reached British intelligence agents in England. On a particular afternoon in question, a particular memo had appeared in the hands of a young commander of the British Royal Navy, having arrived from the inside source within Germany. Now, this is what Hess proposes to do, the message read. He wants to fly to England alone. The man poring over his intriguing message had been no other than 32-year-old Ian Lancaster Fleming, who had author of the famous novel of spies and an adventure featuring secret A07, otherwise known as James Bond. British writer Donald McCormack, who worked on Fleming at the foreign desk of the Sunday Times and later penned one of his bi biographies, maintained that Fleming's inside contact had been particular and perhaps even an enigmatic woman named Vanessa Hoffman. McCormack claimed that he was briefed about the situation by Fleming later on, but was allegedly urged not to breathe a word of it. While Fleming was still alive, Fleming met Hoffman in Germany prior to the war, and with her knowledge of obscure social circus and a penchant for gathering information, she continued to serve as a conduit for leaks filtered to Fleming by spies and various informants infil infiltrating the Reich. Hoffman, though very well connected, was no spy, however. Bill Flinderth, oh, what a name, Flinderth, <laughs> Later revealed 
had to be an intelligence agent named William Otto Lucas, had been the insider that had bought her word that Hess was becoming restless. Networking with the anti-fascist network in Switzerland, as well as a handful of moles directly with the Gestapo, Lucas had attained the word that Hess might possess noble aspirations to enter peace talks and thus pass the information along to Hoffman. According to McCormack and others, several of the war's most sensitive details at the time were said to be obtained through the secretive chain of command, complete with intelligence intelligence information of the United States, Helga Stoltz, who worked in a room adjacent, adjacent to Hitler's office at the Berghof, his home in Swiss Alps. Though his various information sources, William Lucas had many obscure bits of information, which eventually began to outline a rather bold idea. British intelligence might be capable of exploiting, of all things, the strange occultist interests that the Nazis appeared to maintain with gusto. It was already known in various intelligence circles that the Nazis may have a strong penchant for occult sciences based on such as astrology, as well as secret societies that emphasise aspects of pagan ritual. Such strange bits of crypto history caused a surge in interest in the subject of Nazi occultism. Within the decades that followed the war, with such books as Poorwells and the Burgers, The Morning of Magicians hit the bookstore shelves in the 1960s. But during the actual years of conflict, few intelligent intelligence bodies along the Allies had seemed to give much serious thought to the idea that the Nazis might be manipulated in some way by cashing in on their occult fascinations. William Lucas was well aware of this apparent lack of interest, even suggested that the United States, who also had been receiving information from Lucas and his informants, might oblige the situation. However, Vanessa Hoffman was still serving as a liaison between Fleming and Lucas's networks, had also been introduced to occult studies such as astrology in Germany near a dec nearly a decade earlier. In addition to sharing certain aspects of this interest with Fleming, thus Fleming himself had already taken a bit of liking to various assistants. One might speculate that personal interest in such things could have inspired his eventual decision to pursue this strange tactic, having said that he decided to be someone else who might effectively exploit the idea. The plan yet to unfold would be very much the labour of Fleming's own undertaking, as official backing by agencies such as MI5 had not existed. Fleming's interest in the matter, however, had been shared by at least one other prominent MI5 agent, Fran Charles Henry Knight, who served, later served as inspiration for the character M in Fleming's James Bond novels. And if you're wondering if that name looks familiar, yes. While the Allies had indeed hoped to starve off an attempt, an invasion by Hitler, many of Winston Churchill's stronger stronger military activities were later fall under criticism. This was especially during the case with the 1945 bombings of Germany city Dresden towards the end of the war. It got obliterated. It was just pummeled. In which the majority of the casualties had been civilians. Fleming, on the other hand, had been seeking more peaceful through subversive tactics early on and thus appeal of luring Nazis for purpose of espionage had obviously struck a core, a sorcerer. Vanessa Hoffman's occult interest and the exposure she gave him along the lines may indeed have first procured Fleming's only interest in the occult, but rather strangely, it was Maxwell Knight who had directed prior involvement with one of England's most notorious occultists, the infamous Alistair Crowley. Crowley himself had worked as an informant during the war, much like Hoffman, and after being introduced to Fleming, two were purported to have died a number of times at the Cavendish Hotel. It was Rosa Lewis, owner of the exclusive establishment at 82 Jermaine Street, which, it's worth nothing, very close to residence Cowley had at the time, who claimed that she had actually served Crowley and Fleming on a number of occasions in 1941. During these dinner time talks at the stately Cavendish, the beginnings of time project referred later by Fleming as Project Mistletoe, a reference to the mythical character Boulder of Viola, began to formulate precisely how occult influence over the Nazis be used to Britain's advantage. And just a little bit of fun fact on Alistair Crowley's famous home. Uh, the, the singers of uh, Van Halen actually bought Crowley's home. Never lived in it, but because it was too 
uh, had too many uh, strange going-ons. According to McCormack's biography on Fleming, this eventually resulted in the completion of an elaborate magical ritual in Ashdown, joined by Maxwell Knight and, of course, Ian Fleming, dressed in an effigy made to resemble Hess. The ensuing ceremony had been intended in evoking the restless Hess by magical means. However, the sole testimony to this event ever have been transpired can be attributed to the late Armando Crowley, who claimed, in addition to being Crowley's illegitimate, illegitimate son and protege, that had literally been present at the ritual itself. Well, there was little doubt that Knight, Fleming and Crowley had indeed shared involvement with regard to the intelligence of little supporting evidence exists for the so-called fireworks display said to have taken place at Ashdown Forest. Indeed, likely this occurrence of bizarre rituals is a simple fact that Crowley, being renowned for his occult interests, had simply been the best candidate for providing official consultation on astrological matters to the British intelligence. With regard to the use of horoscopes as medium and a propaganda of misinformation, British journalist Eric Howe's 1982 book The, the Black Game detailed how he had been recruited by British intelligence during World War II for the purpose of fabricating horoscopes that would be sent directly to Nazi strongholds. There were subscriptions to popular historic magazines called Zenit were already been sent. Additionally, subversive information regarding the supposed existence of an underground Anglo organization known as the Link was also floated through various channels, which included the Zenit horoscopes. The process was described thusly by Maxwell Knight's biography masters. He briefed an astrologer, Vara Swiss agent, also an agent, to infiltrate Hess's occult circles in Germany. Thus he successfully did, ensuring that Hess was given the picture that he and Knight had conceived, that an influential band of plotters who wished to bring down Churchill and the government and negotiate peace with Germany. The message was passed to Hess by fake horoscope capture. Again, history shows the attempts at subversively urging Hess to make these strange solo flights must have been successful to some degree. On the evening of May 10, 1941, at about 7 p.m., Hefless Askenberg Messerfurt BF-110D it was eventually shot down that evening flying over Scotland. Hess parachuted from his plane and landed near Floor's Farm, Eagles Eaglesham, injuring his ankle in the process. Some accounts describe Hess being arrested by a farmer armed with only a pitchfork as depicted in one newsreel of the time. I decided to fly to England after the Converse of Führer in June 1940. The delay was caused by difficulties in obtaining a machine and long-range equipment as well as unfavourable weather conditions, Hess later said of his trip. Meanwhile, back in Germany, Hitler's response to the Hess's solo flight had been anything but supported. The Nazis soon launched what became known as the Atkin Hess, involving the arrest of literally hundreds of people in Germany who had fallen under the suspicion of treasonous activities. Not surprisingly, a number of the arrests made during the time had been astrologers. Hess's own astro astrological advisor, Erning Ernest Schulzenstrass, had denied having any given any information that may have influenced Hess, though he's imprisoned nonetheless on the grounds that he had advised Hitler's deputy to make the May 10th flight. The Atkin Hess had been described that Hess had indeed fallen under the influence of astrologers during the period of what to was failing health. Hess, it is said, was very troubled when he became aware of such reports and that the Fuhrer himself had even labelled him publicly as a madman. But even support, supposing that Hess had made the decision to engage London and peace talks all on his own accord with no interest or urging the British intelligence via magical rich, rituals or phony horoscopes, we find here again that Alistair Crowley figures in to the story of war. Fleming had apparently urged British intelligence to allow Crowley with his own obvious prowess as an occultist to interrogate the imprisoned Hess. A personal letter from Crowley related by Fleming's biographer John Pearson stated that It is true that Hess is much influenced by astrology and magic, my service to the department. In that case, he should not be willing to do what you wish. Brigadier Roy Firebrus who, just as it turns out, had been the first president of the Astrological Association of Great Britain, was employed during the interrogation instead. 
due in part to the multitude of strange, historic, symbolic aspects that were coming forth in a rambling of notable, notably off Hess. And yet, as strange as the entire Hess affair had been, one final curges regarding Fleming's involvement in the alleged attempt to allure the famous Nazi to England. In 1940, a book written by Fleming's brother, Peter Fleming, titled The Flying Visit, Adolf Hitler and is cast in the visionary who leaps into a plane and flies to England. In the story, Hitler parachutes down and is approached, apprehended by a British agent, after which peace talks then ensure with his captors. Of course, this work was published several months before Sorrid Hess affair. And yet, we must ask, could Peter Fleming's story have somewhat influenced his brother's attempts at actuating, actualizing the strange set of circumstances? This wasn't the case at all. According to Peter Fleming, who fervently denied the rumor until his death, calling it merely a new, a new legend, brother, regardless of the entire story, is rife with particular circumstances and, of course, strange synchronicities. Whether or not Ian Fleming and the Great Beast 666 had indeed played a significant role in luring Hess to England will remain a mystery. What cannot be denied, however, is that both men had nonetheless conspired to bring about the events almost precisely as they came about, and Hess was indeed successfully captured. Perhaps it was at least one famous wartime master of its spies, along with his sorcerer acquaintances, would have enjoyed thinking they were indeed masterminds behind the whole affair. There you go. Did you know about that? About Ian Fleming and Hess and uh, all this occultism? You know, Hitler was a Rothschild. I'll add a short little bit to this one later. Anyway, thanks for watching. You have a great day. Much love. Bye now.